Hello, everybody, and welcome again to Nerd of the Third Power, your one-stop shop for all things nerdy and awesome. And Master Ceremonies, Dr. Gonzo. With me, as always, this epic quest of awesomeness is our resident anime goddess, the cat. Cat, how are you doing? I'm alive. I guess that's something. One of those days, huh? Yeah, it's been one of those months. We've been, like, down a guy at work, and I've been covering another department for, like, four weeks. And it's just kind of been hell. And today was shit show. Oh, really? Oh, God. Well, that sucks. Uh, are you still uh, you still flooded out over there? Um, actually, I mean, it's the, the water's still really high in a lot of places, and there's still some roads that are closed, but all the major roads are open. So I can actually see my parents again, and that's nice. Yay, that's a good thing. Okay. Brian, how about you? How are you how are you doing? Doing all right. I had a successful free comic book day. I almost thought I was gonna miss free comic book day. Uh just because I was working at the time and I didn't think anything would be left over by the time I get out of work and hit the comic shop. But no, they still have plenty left. So is free comic book day to you what the Steam summer sale is to me? Just a high holy time that you absolutely cannot miss? Well, I mean it, uh, I would like not to miss it, if that makes any real sense, uh, just because it's cool to see um, everyone go to a comic book shop. I can do a little bit of shopping around and trying to see all the different, uh, what may be coming up in the future for a lot of different publishers outside of the big two. So I like to go and I like to do it every year if I can. Uh, if I miss it, I'll be sad, but I don't think it's a can't miss situation. Okay. All right. Okay, cool, cool. All right, well, glad to see you guys are here. Uh, Skyblaze has, has been worn out from work, so she will not be joining us this week. Uh, sadness, but uh, we got a lot of fun. Sh- we got a fun show planned tonight. We're discussing Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Two, uh, which uh, we've really been looking forward to, and it's going to kick off our summer movie season, which uh, means that coming up with show ideas for the next few, for the next couple months is uh, going to be much easier than it normally is. So yay! So that's going to be fun. But uh, of course, we're going to begin this procedure to follow. And uh, we are going to begin with the random topic of the week. And uh, for that, I turn to you, uh, Kat. Uh, you're, a, you're a regular gym goer, aren't you? Yeah. Um, I, I go on and off. Like, every couple of years, I start going to the gym. I'm trying to be healthy. And then I'll hurt myself and stop being able to go. But I'm <laughs> currently going to the gym in the hopes of dealing with the arthritis left over from my broken foot. But, yes, I am a gym goer. Okay. Reason why I ask is because, uh, you know, I, I recently had, you know, once a century physical, and the doctor basically said that I'm coming part of the scene before I'm 40 unless I make some uh, major changes. And one of them is uh, is going to the gym and, and or getting some, getting some kind of exercise and working out. But uh, the problem I have is, is I just can't, you know, I'll, I go to the, it's not that I, I can't get motivated to go to the gym. It's I can't get motivated to stay there because I'll get bored and be like, ah, fuck this. I'm out of here. So uh, I guess now my question is, uh, what are what are what are some things that uh, that that what's some music that you listen to to kind of get you into that uh, that fist pumping mood that you know gets you into that that workout? I mean, what what kind of what kind of tunage do you play while you're at the gym? Uh, first off, when I go to the gym, I don't run. I can't run. I'll die. Um, if you've ever wanted to see somebody limp run while wheezing, that would be me. Um, but if I do want to try and run or jog, I usually try and listen to some power metal, get a little dream theater, get a little master plan going, maybe some amaranth. Um, but generally when I go to the gym, I don't actually listen to music. I will actually watch a movie or something on my tablet or um, on my phone, especially now that Netflix has the download feature. I have been downloading episodes of MST3K onto my phone and watching them while I'm at the gym. It's more entertaining to me than listening to music. My mind wanders with music and it usually wanders to how miserable I am while I'm at the gym. But if I have something more active like a movie or a YouTube video or something, then my brain is a little more focused on that and it's thinking less about how horrible I feel. Okay. So music doesn't quite do it for me anymore. Usually um, usually it's now it's Netflix, but it used to be uh, Google Play would occasionally have movies that you could download for free and I would just try and pick up a couple of movies here and there. Okay. Uh, Brian, what about you? You've got, if you've, if you've got something that you, you need to do and you're not to it or you, you get exasperated easily, what, is, what, what do you do to, to, to keep yourself motivated? Um, that's a very good question. Sometimes I will take a break with some music, but more often than not, I will 
just find something like I'll read a lot sometimes, or I'll put on an audio book. Uh, just let kind of let that sort of, I'll just sort of relax and let that sink in and usually it recharges myself enough that I can go back to doing what I was doing. Um, just, and sometimes, so like, it could be just pulling out my phone, playing uh, a quick little game of something or playing some, a quick game of like solitaire on my computer, or even just a couple, couple rounds of overwatch and like, all right, I feel better. I'm feel a little bit looser. My mind's a little bit clearer. All right, let's go back to what I was doing. Okay, because like I like when I go to the gym, I'm like I've been experimenting with like different uh you know different music types to kind of keep myself going. And uh, I'll tell you two songs that I found that uh and really get me uh get, get me going on the on the treadmill, the elliptical. Uh, the first is the Punch Out theme, specifically the the cover done by uh a, by a, a band called Game Over. Uh, they do a really awesome metal version of the Punch Out theme, and uh, one that I'm honestly surprised that Cat hasn't mentioned, and that's a uh, Be a Man from Mulan. Like, I don't know, uh, it, it, you know, like, I put that, I don't know what it is about the song, but, like, I put it in, it's like, you know, I feel like I'm going to step back in the ring again. I will say, yeah. um, oh, sorry, that I when, I do, my, when I do my yoga, DDP yoga, because it's from a DVD, having a guy there kind of, like, counting down with you, you know, telling, like, and just going through with it, it keeps me motivated and keeps me looking at it and keeps me going with it. You know, three, two, one, breathe. Oh, you're doing so good. I'm like, oh, I feel so great. I'm dead, but I feel so great. It hurts, but it feels so good. <laughs> like, like, and th- like, part of the reason for this is like, you know, dead before I'm 40. But also, it's like, you know, as I mentioned in in the last episode, you know, I used to box and I used to be in really great shape, and now I'm kind of like, you know, I part of the thing that really spurred me on this was uh, I was digging through, uh, you know, I'm, I'm starting to move all my stuff into into my room because you know I've got my housing situation stayed, and I found a uh, I found an old picture of myself from uh, my, you know. In, in, in my boxing shorts and my gloves before, you know, it, it, I became the, the fat job of the hut slug that I am now. And I'm just like, wow, I have like really let myself go. So like, I'm, I'm looking to see if I can kind of maybe, maybe not reclaim my glory days, but maybe get back to, to some semblance of healthiness so that like, you know, if I go to get a blood test drawn again, you know, they're not pulling out just high fructose corn syrup out of my veins. <laughs> That's disgusting. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you know, my diet for the last several years has exclusively been stuff that's been delivered to me in 30 minutes or less. So, you know. Oh, so hungry right now. <laughs> so, you know, so that's that's sort of the, the, the topic that we're sending to you guys is not necessarily gym exclusively, but like if you've got if you've got a task or something that you've got to do that you know you just absolutely hate or you're gonna get exasperated and bored by, what do you do to keep yourself motivated? You know, give me give me some ideas for motivators. I want to know uh what 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 are some, some some stuff I can try to you know keep the fighting spirit going. You know, because I mean Be a Man is an awesome song, but you know, you can only listen to it on repeat so many times before people start thinking you're weird. I haven't reached that number yet, but I'm sure it's there. <laughs> So, but anyway, so uh, that's the random topic for this week. And uh, so now next up is the Ask a Geek, which is our favorite uh, segment of the show. And we've got some good questions here. Uh, Frequent offender Tyler Wheeler has a few questions for us. Uh, His first question is for all of us. He asks if we've been watching the fifth season of Samurai Jack. And I know I have. Brian, what about you? Have you been watching? I've been trying to keep up. I can't sometimes I don't be I can't watch it the Saturday of. But luckily, I mean, you to be able to catch it again later on. Um, it's interesting. Uh, it's very, it's, it's a hell of a way to end the show. That's what I'm ta- uh, I've seen so far. Okay. And Kat, I know, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure you didn't follow the original series, but have you been following the, the new season at all? I've never seen a single episode of, of Samurai Jack, not a oh, single okay. one, which I feel bad because I know it's a great voice cast, um, which is oh. something I think I would enjoy about it. But for some reason I never got into it. Oh, I, 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 I think you'd love it. And not just for the voice acting, but for the art style. Um, so I know, I know that they had the first four seasons on Netflix a while ago. I, I don't think they'd still do, which disappoints me greatly. But uh, I have been following season five uh, faithfully, and I am absolutely loving it. Uh, the episode that uh, came out this last Saturday about the uh, the space prison. Um, I, I, I like the twist at the end, uh, no spoilers. Um, but I, you know, I, I, I felt like the, the episode other than that was just kind of a filler one. So I was a little disappointed by that. Uh, I'll tell you, uh, the episode I love the most so far though. And that was, I think it was season, uh, it was episode six, excuse me, episode six. It was six or seven. It's the one where Jack goes off to, uh, to, to finally, uh, commit seppuku over his failures and is looking for him. 
And she, uh, for those who don't, who, who haven't been following the fifth season, it takes place 50 years after the conclusion of season four. And Jack has uh, this woman following him named Ashi, who was originally an, uh, one of Aku's assassins, who Jack has convinced that, you know, Aku is evil, and so now she's his fight. And the whole of the sixth season is her going around trying to find Jack, and she runs into all of these people that he has helped in the past and learning their and it's just really touching to see these old characters come back and talk about how you know this random samurai came in and helped them and uh i'm telling you if you show me uh who's seen the rave scene from that episode and the song uh that they sung about jack and didn't get teary-eyed i'll show you somebody with a body in their basement so i didn't i didn't get teary-eyed and i don't own a basement (laughs) Okay. okay, then the shed, the <laughs> trunk of your car, you heartless bastard. <laughs> your closet. I, I mean, I, I don't. I guess it was a good scene, but I didn't get teary eyed over it. I just, I don't know. <laughs> I, I did. You know, I was watching it, and, and you know, I was. What's this moisture coming from my eyes? And what's this? What's this thumping noise coming out of my chest? Oh, that's my heart. I have one of those. That's right. <laughs> so yes. Uh, you know that's uh that, okay. So let's see. He also asks. Uh, he also asks. He asks me how far did I get through with those recommendations from a few episodes back when we did the uh, the topics from a hat and uh, you guys recommended a bunch of stuff to me. Um, I'm actually gonna have to go back and listen to that episode again and write down those names because I confess things have been so crazy uh, in my life. I uh, I haven't had the chance to actually look up any of those things. So uh, yeah, I, I I feel bad and I'll have to go into the pain glove after the conclusion of the show. <laughs> okay let's see here uh oh uh, actually that you mentioned a free comic book day because we have one here from mark and he asks what did you find anything good on free comic book day uh i found through my store what they had left they the there is a uh doctor who from titan comics i believe they, uh, they did actually instead of doing like a preview there's actually a story uh, that they did for uh, four doctors um, from David Tennant all the way to Peter Capaldi, like meeting this one character and following through the, his life and helping him out and like re- helping him live and try to keep peace with his planet. It was actually quite fascinating. I like it. I haven't read any, much of the Titan books of the Doctor Who series. So I'm, it's kind of nice to pick that up. Also the IDW Star Trek, the next generation, they did a preview for the mirror broken series, which is the, next generation version going into the mirror universe basically you know so the it's the evil it's the evil federation all that kind of good things which i don't think i've i don't remember they've ever done before but yeah those yeah so those are like two really good ones i picked up is i also picked up the things from like marvel and dc and stuff like that okay okay cool all right and uh cat let's see if i got one here for you uh, i did some shopping on free comic book day Oh, you did? Well, what did you, what did you find? <laughs> you know, what a rarity that I had bought American comics, but... Uh, well, like I said, I, that, 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 that's why I, I, I didn't think to extend the question to you, because every time I brought up the topic of you uh, getting into American comics, you, you, you bare your teeth and begin hissing like a snake, so I thought you were rather hostile <laughs> to the idea. Really, of all the animals that I'm going to bare my teeth and hiss like, you pick snake? Oh, I anyway. didn't want to go for the obvious joke. <laughs> Um, I, you know, I don't read American comics really. I've been trying to get into the, uh, the Hawkeye comics because I really adore Hawkeye. Um, but I do want to support my local comic book shop and they have like back issues, back issues for a nickel on free comic book day. So I said, nah, I've got cash for the first time in a thousand years. I'll go give them some cash and just pick out whatever looks interesting and probably sell it all, um, to, uh, another store and you know like five years when i need to move again but i i did find a copy of a duck avenger with donald duck as a superhero and i ran it by cabo and he said it was good so now i'm a little proud of myself for finding it because i did not find a single other duck avenger there i found like one issue um i did find some of the poe dameron and lando uh, Star Wars comics, which I had been kind of interested in because I feel like that's concise enough I could follow it. So I'm kind of excited about these purchases. Well, the the thing with the Lando one, the Lando one was a mini series, so it was so it was a one and done kind of thing. 
Yeah, that's what I'm hoping Poe is going to be too, because like I bought some other random Star Wars ones, but I I remember seeing Lando in a more concise form. Yeah. I'm like, okay, this is good. If it's short, I might be able to deal with it. But most American comics, I just, uh, it's tedious. Okay. And uh, he's also got one here for me. He asked if I've picked up the touch yet. And if it has, if I have, if it's changed my mind about VR gaming at all, uh, I have, it has. And uh, actually me and Skyler has been talking about uh, if we can ever rescue her from spice mines of Kessel long enough to do an episode, doing a follow-up to our VR discussion and uh, discussing uh, now that we've had a little bit more, uh, more in-depth exposure to it, uh, our, our new thoughts uh, regarding VR gaming. So uh, look for that down the line. And uh, so, yeah, so that's about all the uh, Ask Geek questions that we had this week. We're going to take, spend a little bit more time on our discussion topic this week because I'm pretty sure we're going to have a lot to talk about. But as always, you can send us your questions through the email at drgonzo at nerdofthethirdpower.com. Uh, or if you don't want to send an email, we're also, I'm also uh, taking, take, I'm making an effort to troll through the YouTube comments to see if I can t- to find any questions that wind up getting dropped in there. So go ahead and drop your questions in a YouTube comment and, or send it to us through the email, and uh, maybe your question will be read on the air. So uh, on to our discussion topic, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. Uh, this has been a movie that we've all been really looking forward to because we all really loved the first film. It was one of the breakout hits of, uh, of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Really, it, it was a movie that nobody really saw coming, and nobody expected to be as, as high quality a film as it was. So the, the announcement of the second film uh, had us all really excited. So, uh, you know, we're, we got a chance to see it this weekend, and so we're going to we're gonna take this episode and uh, talk about it. So, uh, Brian, let's start with you. What, are, what were your general thoughts on Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2? I enjoyed the film for definitely what it was. It was a, it, it's, I did, I feel like it did suffer a little bit from sequelitis where all the good stuff that happened in the first film, we shall do again and much bigger and much louder and more colorful. Sometimes that distracted from the film and other times it actually made the film a lot better. So I think, um, I don't know if I would consider it as good as the first film because the first film I, was a surprise hit, but no, overall, my, this was a, I think a great follow up and a good, and a good sort of centralized characters where a centralized story with these characters on their own. It doesn't, wasn't necessarily connected to everything else that was happening in the Marvel cinematic universe. Cause they were out in space, but so it's kind of nice to see that happen as well. That it's, it's its own thing. It could stand on its own. Okay. Kat, what about you? Where were you, where, was you, where were your general first galaxy volume two? Um, well, one of my friends had gone to see it before me and had said that no matter how hard he tried, he couldn't think of a single problem with the film. He couldn't think of a single criticism. So I went in with these really high expectations and it was a fantastic film, but I do have a couple of criticisms that I might be the only one who who is thinking about this. So I'll be curious to see what you guys think about the details. Okay, well, uh, you might find, depending on what you're, you're find me in agree. And uh, I guess I'll just come out and say it, just rip off the Band-Aid. I was actually disappointed by this film. Um, Leg gasp. <gasps> I know heresy, right? Yeah, I'll, I, yeah, I've, I've, Shaman I've, non-believer. <laughs> I've, I've, I've got my shield and helmet on. I get backlash on this, but I actually came away from this film really kind of disappointed with it. Um, it felt very disjointed and slapdash at points. I felt like there were a lot of things that that this film tried to do that weren't really connected in any real way it felt like a very disconnected film and um i don't know if that's because i they tried to do something different with this film that i just wasn't expecting or maybe i tainted my expectations by watching the first film immediately before going to go see this movie uh but i gotta say so far for me this movie is the first real big disappointment uh in the marvel cinematic universe and uh i guess we will we'll jump in and start uh dissecting the film and uh and discussing why we liked or or did not like it uh it, you know depending on on the case may be and uh we will begin as always with the plot and script so uh brian as uh, as the more knowledgeable of us on this subject uh why don't you give us a brief rundown of the plot of this film okay so you the film definitely starts out where the guardians are doing a job for a race called the sovereign they are successful at said job Unfortunately, Rocket Raccoon steals some batteries from these people, and they take any sort of transgression with uh, death. They will kill you. And these so, aren't just regular batteries, like AA batteries. 
let's 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 clarify here. These are like cosmic cube levels of power here. Well, I mean, they were very they were vaguely they're like these are really powerful batteries. I believe you. Like that was sort of the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what happened at that point is that the sovereign is after the guardians because of this transgression. But this is where the movie sort of splits in a couple different plots. So what eventually the sovereign do is hire Yondu, uh, Star Lord's old, uh, I guess. A good way of putting him, his old his old handler of the Ravengers to go after them. But at the same time, Star Lord meets his father, Kurt Russell, aka Ego. So and it's sort of so some of the characters, uh Gamora and Drax, go with Ego uh, to with with Star Lord to his planet, and we get to learn his backstory where Peter Quill sort of came from or, or how he got to where he was and the power that sort of held within him while Rocket and Groot meet up with Yondu again, and they're off on their own because Yondu, unfortunately, is still trying to protect Peter, and as such, he loses command of his ship, gets mutinied upon, and has to then try to get out of that situation to go and rescue Peter because everyone's after him for this transgression. The Sovereign hired them for a lot of, I'm not sure if it was money, it was credits or something, to bring him back and kill him. So as these two plots are sort of happening simultaneously, they eventually come back together, as we learn. Ego is not this wonderful entity that he turns out to be. It turns out he's actually the bad guy of the film who wants to destroy the galaxy. Well, not destroy the galaxy, but remake the galaxy in his image using Peter, since Peter has that special power within him because he's a celestial. Celestial? Celestial. celestial. Whatever. That's sort of when I feel like the main sort of villain, uh, not main villain, but main story kind of takes place is when we get the twist of uh, who actually is the real villain of the film. In this, uh, Gamora's sister, uh, ne- is it Nebulans? Nebula? Nebula. Nebula. There's a lot of, there, I want to say this right now. While I love the fact that we have alien races, what the fuck is with their names? Because just I, sometimes I can't remember. You, 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 yeah, you wind up putting R's where R's should not be. <laughs> I just, just say the wrong words sometimes. <laughs> but she uh, she actually gets, eventually gets, uh, she was tagging along with the Guardians before sort of freeing herself, but then going after Gamora on her own. Uh, that's more of a subplot than an actual plot. But the reason, there's a lot of different reasons why she does it and their fight and where it sort of takes their relationship later on. So at sort of the end of the film, everyone gets back together for the big blockbuster ending special effects extravaganza. The galaxy is in fact save again, but there is tragedy involved in it as well, leaving uh, a character no longer, uh, no longer living and everyone's kind of sad. So, I mean, that's sort of the cliff notes version of the guardians of the galaxy uh, plot wise. And the script I thought was went from very well to yeah, kind of odd at, at certain points. The, the way I sort of put it is that whenever there was a quiet moment in the film, whenever you're sort of studying where these characters are going, I liked it more than the bombastic uh, action scenes. Because the bombastic action scenes to me felt more comical and cartoony, which we'll get to a little bit later. But when the film slowed down, I thought that's where a lot of the good came from this film. A lot of the good, like the heart, if you will, came from the film. Okay. Kat, what about you? What are, what are your thoughts, your general thoughts on the plot of the film? Um, I thought it was a good, solid story. Um, it might be a little too early to talk about the character of Ego, but um, I thought it was nice to have a good villain again. We haven't had a really good villain for a while, a villain with real personality and, and you know, unique unusual motivations and I felt that really gave a lot to the story and it was a very emotional journey for almost every character it was almost more less of a an actual story and more of an emotional journey for you know more like you know character development which god forbid a movie have and it feel good and natural you know so I really really felt like the subtitle of the film should be called like guardians of the galaxy family therapy yeah, Guardians of the Galaxy hooked on a feeling. <laughs> <laughs> and the feeling is the whole time. It's just so many feelings, all of it. Um, it's really good. I I really enjoyed the story of it. 
See, the, 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 the plot of the film was really my big issue, was that I was confused for a, a very large portion of the film as to what the main plot was going to be. Uh, I mentioned this to Brian before the show. It felt like there were three different stories going on at once that we didn't get the connection between them until the very end because you had you had Star-Lord and learning about his, his, his heritage with Ego and dealing with, uh, you know, the whole sitcom, what I call the, the the sitcom jealousy arc between him and Gamora, um, which will which I felt like that whole thing felt like a bad sitcom episode. I was like, all right, this is what's going to happen. He's going to go off and he's gonna he's gonna be buddy buddy with with Ego. Gamora's going to suspect that something is up. Starlo's going to accuse her of being jealous and be a total dick bag, and then he's going to realize that he was a douche and go back and apologize, and they're going to play the sad violins, and it's going to be like a bad episode of The Fresh Prince. And lo and behold, it was so. But in a weird twist, the movie sort of mentions that. Like, he mentions it like this is a, an unspoken thing, like, because I think he said Cheers. Like, this is like Cheers, or this is nothing like Cheers. So in a weird way, there's like a self-realization about that whole situation. Now, yeah. If you don't think that's good or not, I, I understand that's your personal opinion, but I feel like it's very odd for you to mention that, but not mention that the film also mentioned it. Well, let me finish here. No. <laughs> <'Cause>, <laughs> so you had you had that plot line. Then you had the plot line of Rocket Raccoon and Yondu uh, being held prisoner by the, the mutinying Ravagers uh, and Yondu trying to get get control of his gang back. And then you had the plot line of the Sovereigns chasing down the Guardians for stealing the batteries. Uh, and then there was almost a, a fourth subplot with Nebula trying to get uh, revenge on Gamora, which I was really stoked to, to, to see play out. I thought that was going to be a, a really good plot, uh, especially when uh, Gamora starts ch- gets chased down by Nebula while she's in the ship and Nebula's shooting the machine guns at her and... Uh, the the I thought it was really gearing up to be really good when Gamora ran into that cave and Nebula went flying in after her, completely <laughs> wrecking the ship. I was like, oh yeah, this is what I want to see. This, this this bitch is a special kind of crazy here. Psycho. And uh, you know, Nebula gives this great speech that sent chills down my spine when she takes possession of the ship about how like you know Thanos would make her and Gamora fight every time Gamora won. You know, Thanos would rip something out of Nebula and replace it with cybernetics and a you know, in, in an effort to make her Gamora's equal and just had the hate and resentment in Nebula's voice. And I was like, oh, man, with these two throw down, it is going to be fucking awesome. You know, and they started, like I said, really good. Nebula, special kind of crazy. Crashes a fucking ship into a fucking cave. She's just that driven to kill Gamora. Then she's finally got Gamora at her mercy, hands at her throat, knife in her other hand, ready to kill her. And she just lets Gamora go and says, look, I just, it says basically in so many words, look, I just wanted to win a fight for once. And I was like, really? You had all that buildup and that's how you're going to fucking end it? You're just going to have it, it just that whole thing just felt like it fizzled out to me. And that really sort of embodies how I feel about so many of the different plots and, 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 and character developments that happened over the course of this film is I felt like we didn't see a whole lot of them really pay off. Like, you heard this whole uh, thing with, like, you know, Rocket talking about how, like, you know, he got ripped apart and, and put back together then again. We never saw him, re- you know, really develop from that. And they were playing up this whole thing about, like, oh, Rocket's got to learn not to push people away. And Yondu talking about how he was a war slave and, you know, how he wound up becoming the, the, the space pirate that he is. And, uh, you know, we had a, a pseudo relationship developing between Drax and uh, Mantis. And I've got things to say about Drax, but we'll get to him when we start talking about the cast. But I felt like with the exception of, of star Lord and ego Yondu and maybe possibly depending on what they do with it in the next film, star Lord and Gamora's uh, relationship. I felt like we didn't see a whole lot of those arcs pay off. Um, See, I would almost disagree because um, just because they didn't have a conclusion or we didn't learn all information that we need doesn't necessarily mean that they didn't pay off. To me, the whole showdown with Nebula and Gamora paid off because they reconciled. Just because they didn't have the fight that you wanted to see, I think that still paid off. Um, It wasn't so much that it fizzled out so much as nebula came to the realization of what she really wanted 
Um, well, I'll 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 be upfront. I have I have to be fair here. I'm fully open to the possibility that this movie was trying something new that I just didn't see. So that maybe if I go back and see the film again, I'll change I, I'll change my mind. But I haven't had the time to do that, so I'm just going off what I, I feel after the first viewing. Um, maybe well, if I go go back in knowing what to expect, I'll I'll have a different opinion. But you know. That, that, yeah. that maybe I'll follow I mean, that up in another the same episode. expectations as us, but yeah, I, I disagree I, a bit with your with your, with Yondu as well because I Yondu's story was a story of redemption. Like, yes, he talks about being a slave, but his story was he did something bad, and so him and his crew are technically not like even though they're called the Ravagers, the other Ravagers don't recognize him because he did something really bad, and him taking in Peter, and then what he does does sort of throughout the film is him trying to make up for that. And that was a good payoff in my well, opinion. No, like, 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 no, I, I loved how Yondu's art played out. Like that was one of the ones that I felt like we got a good payoff for. And if, uh, especially when uh, he winds up uh, dying at the end and, uh, you know, spoilers. Look, we've got, we've been doing this for 200 episodes. If we got to tell you there's spoilers in our movie reviews, Hey, welcome to the show. We hope you'll stick around. <laughs> Don't but, worry. I'll put it in the description. <laughs> but uh you know no i i got i got really teary out of that i which really surprised me because i thought that yondu in the first film was a, a rather flat one note character so i was really surprised by how much they were able to do with him in this film uh which i guess brings us to uh the the next part uh the next portion of the film for us to dissect and that is the uh the cast and acting in this film so uh cat what are what are your thoughts on the the characters of this film um Mostly, well, again, like I said, I was really excited about Ego. Um, <laughs> that's not his dad in the comics, right? No. I'm not just misremembering the only comic books that I've ever read. That's not his dad in the comics. No, that is not. Ego is not Peter Quill's father in the comics. You are you are quite correct. Can I can I just point out the irony of of Cat knowing more about about Guardians of the Gods of the comics than I do, and I actually worked in a comic book store. <laughs> I bought like three American comics and one of them was Guardians of the Galaxy. <laughs> it is and of one thing I do know is his father was not a planet. He was not human, but not a planet. Um that being said, I was I was because I knew that ego isn't his father in the comics, I spent most of it um wondering if it was all a ploy and and obviously with ego the whole his whole daddy shtick was a ploy but um but i kind of thought oh he's not really his father he's just pretending and he's going to turn his back on peter at any time and that didn't end up happening so i was a little no. disappointed with ego being peter's dad just because it's like the only thing i know from the comics but i still really loved the way that they did it because even though i knew that he was going to end up being the villain when they're out there playing catch with a little ball of light i'm like oh oh that's so sweet oh and, i just want peter to be happy Damn and, it. I, and, can, and can i add to that I cannot remember. I cannot remember any villain in recent memory where I have done such a hard one hundred and eighty on, on, as far as my opinion, and when than I did with uh, Ego when he revealed that he was the cause of of uh, Mama Quill's brain cancer. Oh. You're like, like okay. you want to, you want to talk about a record scratching moment? That is it right there. <laughs> we need to insert that noise. It 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 broke my heart to put that tumor in your mother's brain. What? <laughs> well, that's that. That what brought that brought him out of it, and he just shot him. It's like, yeah. He's like, you know, you're shooting your dad, right? He's like, don't care. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was such a great moment because I was starting to suspect, after, you know, to a point that that um, ego was going to have been the cause of her cancer, and then he flat out says he put it there, and I'm like, oh damn, you piece of shit oh bad fathers bad fathers like, all over the mcu like i was like here, here like as far as ego goes here's what i was i was expecting to actually be a genuine good guy and that what was going to happen was that like the sovereigns or the ravagers were going to were, were going to attack the planet trying to get at the guardians and he was going to help fight them off but then he said that line about the cancer and i was like oh okay this is where we're going I kind of expected it just because his dad in the comics is a huge asshole. 
um, kind of notoriously, he doesn't get along with his dad because his dad's a douche. So I was kind of expecting a, an asshole side to come out, but I didn't expect it to be that. And I was, I really loved the way Peter reacted to that. And just the, you shouldn't have killed my mom, smushed my Walkman. <laughs> The list of crimes that you can commit in the universe against Peter Quill in order of importance. <laughs> it's okay. He got a Zune. He got a Zune. <laughs> Which I doubt anybody nowadays remembers. Oh, I remember Zunes. Okay. All right. Uh, Brian, what, what, what about you? What was the, what, what's, what's the character that was a standout to you? Or Well, I mean, Ego is kind of an interesting character. Because I, I, when I was watching, I was like, man, it's the most Kurt Russell I've ever seen Kurt Russell. And then, like he, then he, when he became the, you know, the villain, the protagonist, he started really like actually kind of scaring me a little bit. I was like, oh, I don't, I don't like you anymore, Kurt Russell. This is stop it. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, well, the only other, like the only other new-ish character that kind of stands out is Mantis, and I'm not sure how I feel about Mantis just yet. Um, just because she was one of the, she, I, she was, she, she's a great character. I think she's a good character in the film. But she also like was for the most part just sort of an exposition plot for a lot of it, you know. Like she she's the one that had the information but hid it for a while, and then only you know came out at the end to reveal it because she realized that she's like sort of turning against her master kind of thing. Um, and but it had, she had some good interactions a bit until the only time I didn't quite like her is when I felt like Drax was kind of being an asshole to her, and she just sort of taking it. Cause like I, oh. cause she had like no social interaction and stuff like that. And I was like, well, this feels, I don't know, mean, almost mean spirit at a time. We was like, you're disgusting. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm disgusting. And I was like, no, no, you're, you look fine. Well, we'll get, we'll get to Drax in a moment because like I said, I've got things to say about him, but yeah, Mantis as a character, I kind of felt like they didn't really know what to really do with her in this movie. Am I the only one who felt that way? Mm, I mean, she's, she's fine. Sure. Yeah, she served a, like she. I hate this. It's this is gonna sound bad when I say it. She served the purpose to the plot, you know, and mm -hmm. that's that was good. There was nothing bad about her, you know, anything like that. But yeah, it's just she was sort of there. The hope is that she's gonna be added to the ensemble later on because obviously the cat the cast is getting uh, and, and the crew is getting just a little bit bigger after every after every film, <laughs> and she does join them. I think later in the comics as well. Um, yeah. The only other character that even was even kind of like. Everyone else sort of still play. Well, I, I, we're being around the bush, but we need to go to Drax real quick just because I do agree a bit where Gonzo and I were talking was that there definitely felt like a shift well, change between Drax and first film and Drax well, and second film. Well, let me, let, me, let, me, let me present the opinion that I gave you before the show. I felt like Drax's characterization in this film was completely different from how it was in the first film. Like in the first film, Drax was like this pained noble warrior type um, and you know, yeah, he didn't get metaphors, but that was like kind of just a little, a little quirk. He was otherwise a very, you know, gr very grounded, very serious, uh, martial type character. Whereas Drax in this film, I mean, he felt like a buffoon. Um, you know, Brian ha asked me to name a few, uh, name an example and I gave him like six, like, you know, the scene at the beginning where he jumps into the, the, the creature's mouth and starts stabbing the, uh, the thing from the inside, howling like a lunatic the whole time. Uh, you know, the, um, the scene where he, I, I called it, I called it a uh, space water skiing where he was dragged behind the ship and getting beaten about by the trees and screaming about how awesome it was. And it just, I, and granted, I admit, I've never read any of the guardians of the galaxy comics, but like, you know, are, are which, which of these, if either of them is closer to his, uh, his portrayal in the comics. Um, my guess would probably be the first one, probably the pain, like you were saying, the pain warrior. But again, I've, as much as I read Guardians of the Galaxy sort of flew under my radar and it still flies under my radar. I really haven't read too much by all accounts. I think cats read more than I have, <laughs> <laughs> but like, yeah, he, he, he felt like a clown in this movie. And uh, I'm wondering, uh, did, Brian's already said that he kind of sort of agrees with me on it, but cat, what did you think of Drax in this film? Drax was fine to me. Um, I didn't really see too much of a disconnect. I just felt like we saw Drax in under new circumstances and in new situations than we had seen him in the previous film. But I didn't feel like there was too much of a disconnect between the first film and the second film. Like, I, yeah, I felt like maybe it, he had a lot more humor situations, but I felt that kind of for Groot more than I felt that for anybody else. 
<laughs> well, I suppose that brings us to uh, to, to the next character, and that's uh, the probably the the most marketable character of this film, and that's Baby Groot. Who uh, I will say they they could have made the whole movie about Baby Groot, and I would have just thrown money at it because he was adorable in this movie. Well, I'm he pretty. Was... I'm pretty sure that's the reason he's in the film, is so people can throw money. <laughs> no kidding. I I love Baby Groot. Don't get me wrong, but probably about 15 minutes into the film, I wanted regular Groot back because Baby Groot is useless. And if that's part of the subplot of the film, is that Baby Groot is useless, um, it was kind of a little painful to watch. Just a little, because I still loved Baby Groot. So cute. Super cute. Anytime the baby Groot was in pain or was crying, I wanted to hurt people. Oh, oh God! The scene where they were they were the Ravagers were kicking him around and dumping beer on him. I was like, you, you yeah. people are assholes! Like, How dare you do that to my son? Like, <laughs> like maternal oh. instincts clicked on. But, <laughs> but I loved yeah. Groot so much in the original film and the comic book Groot. In some of the versions that you know, like I've read some compilations, and Groot is fucking terrifying um it's quite scary and very sweet at the same time and we really got that out of the first film and we got nothing out of that in the second film like we just got oh cute we're gonna put this on a bunch of t-shirts and toys and we're gonna sell it to kids and it was really just there to sell to kids I don't know. I, I as as much as I crack about the marketing uh, of Baby Groot, which was gratuitous. I, I am in full agreement with Cat there. I think that we kind of needed Baby Groot because one thing I did notice in this film was like the big theme was like of this film was like the importance of a family, whether by blood or by choice. And I think Baby Groot and how the other characters interacted uh, with him was sort of the linchpin of that. Uh, particularly like the, the the scene that really the two the two scenes that really stand out to me the most are. Uh, well, the one in the beginning where he's kind of dancing around while the rest of the guardians are fighting, and Gamora's like, you know, you know, Groot, you need to get out of the way, you'll get hurt, and he just waves at her, and she's like, hi, you know, like <laughs> that was you, cute, that like was you amazing. do with a little kid, uh, and then the scene at the end where he climbs up on a, I think it was a, I think it was on Drax's shoulder and like falls asleep in Drax's arms. I was like, oh, that's adorable. That is adorable. See, my, then, my, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, my beef with, with, you know, Groot being the linchpin and all this stuff is that every single character had a fan emotional journey, except Groot. Groot was just cute. Like that was the purpose that Groot served. Like didn't really bring anybody together. Didn't really do very much in terms of the story that could like anything that Groot did in the story could have been given to another character, except dancing around and being adorable. But there was no emotional, no character journey in, in a movie that was essentially a series of major character development journeys. And Groot was just cute. Yeah, and I'll, I'll admit the scene where they're trying to get Yondu's fin uh, like went on for probably a, that, little, yeah. a little too long. Yeah, that, 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 that dragged on way too long. I was and, like, and, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, that goes back to the thing like where my complaint was a lot of times, mostly was just with the rocket and Groot scene sometimes was, uh, except for the very end fight, and we'll get to that a little bit later when we do, I guess, special effects, was that's where, to me, like it was trying to do more of the same with the first film, just bigger and better, but it felt cartoony, you know? When all the care, when Rocket was sending the guys like up into the air from his space mines, I'm not really sure what they would call them, and you would cut back to the silhouette of the guys going up and down, up and down. I was like, I'm watching a cartoon. Or when they do all like 700 space jumps and they're they're screaming and the mouths go wide. Oh yeah. Wide. I was like, this is just a fucking cartoon. Well, yeah, that, that 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 we'll get into that when we get into the presentation. My issue with uh, the the whole Finn scene uh, was more on a technical level. Um, because like I'm 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 a firm believer of the rule of three, which is the the longest that you can drag out a running gag is three times before the audience gets sick of it, and uh, they wound up going through like like five or six different items before I I felt like the movie itself was finally going okay look that's enough when they finally had the the one ravager come in and go that's not it oh the yeah so, the yeah him and yeah. just basically going it looks like this that's what's supposed to and he finally gets it after that yeah. Yeah, uh, a character that I do have a lot of praise for, despite what I said earlier about how her arc uh, wound up ending, was uh, Karen Gillan's Nebula, 
who uh, it was, yeah, I was fascinated to see more into uh, her psyche because she was pretty much just a, a, you know, a glorified henchman in the first film. So it was great to see, you know, into her mind for a bit and see what, you know, life with her, what, you know, life for her was like. And she turned out to be a really tragic character. And I was like, you know, oh, wow, cool. You know, there, there, there's, you know, there's more to this character than we were given in the first film. And this is awesome, which is why I was so disappointed with how that arc ended. But I don't know, maybe the third film will, uh, will, 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 give me something a little bit more satisfying resolution of that. But uh, what did you guys think of Nebula in this film? Loved Nebula in this film. She, uh, she was, she was the silent badass. <laughs> I, I was, I was kind of hoping just from the way the promos made it look like maybe she would come in as the uh, reluctant anti-hero, And that's kind of what happened. Um, and I'm really glad it was because you kind of saw it in the first film that, you know, like she's crazy, but you know where her motivations are, and uh, you could see how the the good guys could turn that to their benefit. And I was really hoping that that's what would happen, and that she would end up allying with them. Oh, so related. Yeah, uh, the, the 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 funny the funniest part of Nebula to me is she is at once the most batshit crazy member of the cast, yet at the same time she's also the only sane man of the team. Like especially like like at the at the start <laughs> so of the movie, true. the the whole thing is really just exemplified to me by the by her 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 part of the the first bit of the film where she's their prisoner and she's like oh yeah, I can't believe I'm she just has this whole I can't believe I'm surrounded by these morons I can't believe I'm in this situation uh, air about her uh, particularly where she basically takes control of the ravagers and then takes a bite out of that fruit and there's a running gag how hungry she is she hasn't been fed so she finally gets hold of this fruit that she's been told she can't have because it's not ripe so she takes a bite out of it spits it on disgust and then while trying to maintain her dignity <laughs> with a, a, a Herculean effort just like it wasn't right <laughs> Uh, there was a part um, closer to the end where everybody's arguing around her and she's just like, oh my God. And what I really, really, my heart and soul wanted was for her to repeat Gamora's line from the first film. I'm going to die surrounded by the biggest idiots in the galaxy. Because that would have been such a nebula thing to say. And it would have been so appropriate. <laughs> another, another, another scene that I really enjoyed with nebula She's in the ship with a Yondu, and the, the ship is getting ready to shut down because it's out of power. And she's like, all right, I'll hook up to my prosthesis. And Yondu's like, I'm just going to warn you, this is going to be painful. And she's like, oh, promises, promises. <laughs> it's like, that that really just sums up the fact that she went through so much, to me, that just sums up the the, the fact that she's been through so much shit uh, being raised by Thanos that she, there's really nothing that the universe can throw at her that will phase her. And I absolutely loved that because that one scene just spoke so much about her character, and I loved it. I don't know, maybe I'm reading far too much into it. I I really wanted to see her take over the Ravagers. <laughs> because it was really close to happening. Um, so I'm well, hoping... I, I'm sorry she can't dethrone Sylvester Stallone just yet. Well, at, <laughs> at least Yondi is Ravagers, then. Which, they're all gone now, except for Craglin. And I... And I guess that brings us to uh, what was, to me, the real surprise of this movie, and that's Yondu. Because he was, I felt, a very one-note character in the first film. But, wow, they really did a lot with him in this movie. He was, I would go so far as to say he was the breakout star of this film. Well, the memes are any indication, yes. Oh, my God. I'm Mary Poppins. <laughs> oh, my God. Yes. That's the, that's the first time I've heard an alien say y'all. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I really loved everything they did with Yondu. It, Except towards the end, the funeral thing just went on too long. It wasn't the conclusion to the film I was hoping to have, basically. So I was a little, a little miffed about it. Um, but otherwise, Yondu really just kind of blew my mind with how much character development he got so quickly. Um, I, I wouldn't say that he was quite one note in the first film, but they kind of made him oh so OP without really ever explaining why um, or or showing him in a respectful way other than just, I'm a redneck space pirate, you know? It wasn't really super interesting. He wasn't really likable. And in this film, they were like, hey, 
we're going to do everything that we did, but we're going to make you love him now. <laughs> oh yeah, he, but yeah, no, Yandu was uh was like I said, he's he's one he's he's one of the things in this movie that I I loved just one hundred percent, and I wish that they had a I, I wish they'd actually done more with Yandu. Um, you know, I they, well, I thought, I'm sorry, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is probably not going to happen, but it is a comic book film. You never know. Yeah. All right. So uh, I think we uh, we've talked a bit about uh, we've talked about all the characters that uh, we have without just repeating ourselves, uh, and we're running a bit long. So uh, let's go ahead and talk about the presentation of this film. How did you get? What did you guys think of the the visuals and sound design of this film? Well, the music was excellent. Not as memorable as the first film. And it's really hard not to compare the two. And you're not supposed to compare it, but I, the, the music was not as memorable. I, I disagree. I have had Fox on the Run on repeat for the last three days on work. It was driving my coworkers crazy because I also listen to my headphones really loud. So my coworker next to me is like, "I swear to God, if you don't put on something else, I will reach across this. I will reach to this cubicle wall and just slap you." <laughs> for the for the soundtrack itself, so I think this one was a bit more. I would say. Well, the first soundtrack is the more probably memorable one. This one felt like more thought out, if it makes any sense. Yeah. Like yeah. these all sort of mean something. Both James Gunn, probably you know the writer and the director, and also will mean something. What's going on in the actual scene that it was brought up on, uh, especially uh, when they were talking about. I've forgotten the song again already. Holy shit, Brian! Brandy. Uh, yep. Thank you. <laughs> like, because that was woven into the plot. <laughs> I love how she wasn't even there for that conversation <laughs> show, but she knew exactly what song you were talking about. Oh, my coworker was saying he's had that song stuck in his head since Saturday. <laughs> okay. But now, so Brian. Like, sound design is fine, and the soundtrack is fine. So, there. What? But now, you were, you were talking earlier about, uh, about the cartoonishness of the film. Uh, so, yeah. So, I mentioned before the, 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 red, the, the, the two scenes that were the most cartoonish to me and sort of took me out of a lot of the action and the biggest cartoonish thing was towards the end when peter's fighting uh his father or fighting ego inside of ego wow egoception all right nobody (laughs) um while they were fighting and like so ego turns into like a rock version of himself and then peter turns into pac-man and oh, it was yeah. that and, I, and it was at that point i was like oh god damn it like i was almost sort of i was getting actually sick of like references and 80s and 80s things in this film and it was, at that point i was like i am i'm so not into this fight anymore you, you we, know what you, we, you, we've re, we reached my line you know what you reacted better to it than i did when when i saw the pac-man scene i was having ptsd flashbacks to pixels of course I win. Yes, that's hilarious. Right. Yeah. And so it's it's that's just a personal preference than anything else. Um and, and in terms of in terms of like other presentations, both in costuming and uh set design and stuff like that, they did a really good job with a lot of it. This one felt more, I guess, in terms I don't know, well, they spent a lot of time on ego and you only really saw a few sections of them and it kind of was kind of nice looking. And then a lot of it was in space or on, on uh, the jungle planet. Uh, so it, it 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 was fine for what it was. I just re- I just reached my limit in terms of action and cartooniness by the time the final final fight scene was happening. The, the, um, but I but I will say, uh, the core the whole the action that was happening on the Ravager ship with Yondu and his arrow. Um, oh my god! Yeah, like someone someone is hanging like not hanging but like showing that reel to someone because they are super proud of that that as they should be. That that is that is somebody's resume right there. <laughs> Especially when the lights go out and oh my and the scene where all the bodies are falling at once and you're just like oh, I've never been so impressed by murder. <laughs> they were I will say there was a weird moment though when because they're all they're killing people left and right, and then Yondu yeah. like hits the engines and Rack is like, you maniac. I'm like, that's where you draw the line. <laughs> <laughs> For me, there there were there were three major problems I had with the the visuals of this film. Uh, the first is the one that Brian already mentioned, the Pac Man scene. The second was, uh, it, I think it's the one time we get a full shot of the actual planet of Ego, and there's a face in, in, on it. There's an actual like face on yeah. the planet, and I was like, really? Okay, well, it's good to see that the moon from Majora's Mask is still getting work. But you know. in my defense, and we, we you'll probably get it. 
in the comments section as well. In 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 comics, that's how he looks. He is I a planet with a face. He's got well, a mustache too, I think, in the and, and a beard. In the comics. Yeah. Well, as again, as as I pointed out before the show, there are things that work on the page that don't necessarily work on film, and I think that's one of them. And I, I then thought the, it was subtle enough. I thought it was just subtle enough not to bother me. Yeah, it, it bugged the hell out of me. And then the third major issue was the sovereigns. I just I I could not take them seriously with just the the yellow makeup and the hair. It it you know what you know what they look like to me? They look like a bunch of data go- cosplayers that had gone horribly horribly wrong. Really? There's something wrong I with your theater cuz they're gold them. pink. Yeah, they're gold. Yeah, pink. they were gold and no, they I, reminded me of elves. I just like I couldn't like I I I couldn't deal with the, the with just the, that the thickness of the gold paint on them, and like I, I just the sovereigns in general just bug the hell out of me. Like especially when uh, it's revealed that their space fighter core is a fucking video arcade, complete with pinball machine noises. I was like, oh, no. that was hilarious. I don't know what you're talking about. I loved sovereigns. Okay, the, the, I'll admit the first time the joke was funny. But like after that, I no, I was like, okay, this is worn thin. Well, they only really did that one time when they had everyone crowd around the one guy, and then he lit yeah. up. Yeah, suck, and Dave. Could, yeah, just, just I was like, what? A, I was like, it's like, oh, you're terrible. I was like, you dick. He was the only one that got farther than anyone else. <laughs> I just love when the one was cracking up at Taser Face. <laughs> <laughs> There's a joke that went on for a little too long, but I was totally okay with the Sovereign bringing it back up. No, I liked the Sovereign. I thought they were very cool looking. Um, very, you know, it. we have to be reminded sometimes that it's space. And I feel like they're taking as many creative liberties as they can, as long as, okay, this is the MCU and we're in space, so we don't have to have people look like normal people. We can have people that look like elves. Which is what they made me think of. They made me think of elves because they were all very like thin and leaf and elegant looking and uh, so into themselves. Okay. All right. Well, we're kind of running out of time here. So uh, let's uh, talk. Let's wrap, start wrapping this up by giving our, our final general thoughts on the film. So uh... wait, wait, the stingers, the stingers. Oh, the, the five credit scenes. I will admit that I'm not the biggest fan of having five post credit scenes. Like we're we're I feel like we're so close to having just a movie of credit scenes, <laughs> like like it, like I don't mind them. Like and these these were fine. None of them made me go, well, that was dumb. But we're also I was like, you're this is a slippery slope, is what I'm saying. You know, let's be careful with the post credit scenes, guys. Anyway, yeah, um, they, uh, they, they, well, they 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 I feel like they went a little overboard. Um. I will say there were there were there were a couple that I did like. I liked the one with the the disheveled sovereign talking about uh, the the creature that created, which I think you said was going to be Adam Warlock. Well, yeah, they called him Adam, yeah. so I was like, "There's only one space Adam I know in Marvel. It's Adam Warlock." Yeah. So I was like, "Okay, cool. This, this looks like it's setting up for some good." And then the other one was, and I think we're all in agreement here, Teenage Groot. That to me was the cringeworthy one. Really. Yeah, no, I was not okay with that. Um, puberty is fucking hard enough to endure. I don't need to watch a char- comic book character endure it. Like, it's not my thing. I didn't really think it was funny to play on stereotypes of moody teens. I don't know. I'm just done with that stereotype being a thing. Maybe it's because I watched um, 13 Reasons Why on Netflix. But um, I did not find any part of that stinger funny. You might have to warn. I might have to warn you then, because I'm think Teen Groot will probably be Infinity War, but I'm not sure. I don't know. At the rate of growth, I'm hoping we'll have normal Groot back. Yeah, I, I'm not, yeah, you know, he actually is growing pretty fast. <laughs> oh, they grow up so quickly. I don't know. I I really like the the teenage Groot uh, stinger. I thought that was hysterical. Um, and I honestly. The only other one that I can remember was the one that Brian, you and I talked about before the show, where uh, I asked you if that was actually the original Guardians team. So yeah, the one that Sylvester Stallone pops up with uh, Vin Rames, uh, yeah, that's supposed to represent the original Guardians of the Galaxy. Um, the 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 obviously the MCU version. Is, this is the first team considered Guardians of the Galaxy was the one with Star Lord and Gamora and all them. 
Uh, but the uh, the ones that the Ravengers have, like they were also in comics, they were the first team. I think this though the movie version, they're more these are obviously more space pirates because S- S- Stallone was like, all right, let's go steal some shit, cock cock, and then credits. Do you do you think that the the that particular team will come back in in future films? That that's actually I'm really curious about that um, because you know if you think the Guardians of the Galaxy right now was obscure characters i was like when i was watching this scene i was like how many people in this theater besides me no one's going to recognize this not a single soul probably not a single soul so <laughs> so, so the that, adam warlock character ah so adam warlock so obviously that is that is in terms of the, the post credit scenes that's the only post credit scene i can see actually leading up to the volume three like being the main sort of antagonist or and possibly then protagonist because he's uh, that's what he is in the film uh, or in the in the comics um it's interesting because they've changed his origins around a little bit but the best way to describe him to non-comic book fans is that he's space dr strange oh so because he has a lot of different co- like powers sort of like that very powerful character but he just hangs out in space he's more of a cosmic character than a, like a magician on earth so that is going to be interesting for them to face because this is the first because everything that the Guardians have faced so far, um, well, let's say Ego is kind of a bit more cosmic-y or mystical, if you will, but he's definitely more up there in that in that line. It, and it'll be an interesting threat, but he's also a protagonist, so I don't think he's going to be the full villain in the next film. You know, they most likely will turn him good or whatever they do have to do. That's just um, that's a guess. I really have no idea. And I have no idea if they're going to bring back the original Guardians to their own film, or maybe they'll just have them show up or something like that as a cool, like little cameos. Okay. Uh, what what else? And what I don't. So we had those. And you also had the the bigger one. We the thing we haven't talked about is the obvious confirmation of Stan Lee's character oh, in yeah. the Marvel universe. You know, for a few years now, people have been like, you know, it'd been really cool if Stan Lee was actually one of the like was the Watcher. And that's why he's everywhere at all times. And this film was like, that's a great idea. Here it is. <laughs> and man, live action watchers look a little freaky. Yeah, they did. <sighs> that I think that's really cool to just give that to the fans. You know, because surely they were watching, you know, the, the internet going, hmm, yes, let's give them what they want. It's not even giving what them want. I'm pretty sure it was more along the lines of like when they were first doing the cameos, like this is really cool. We have Stanley cameoing. And then they saw that went, Oh man, why didn't we think of that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, Oh so yeah, like, that, that was the like, point. Yeah. Like, 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 yeah. Thanks fans. You know, like you're a little bit more clever than us. So good to you. <laughs> <laughs> All the time they had this week. So let's kind of start wrapping things up and uh, giving our final thoughts on the film. So Brian, let's start with you. What are your, your final general thoughts on guardians of the galaxy Two? Uh, I like the film. I think it's a good success to Guardians of the Galaxy 1. Um, it had, it's had its issues. I think it's not a perfect film. It has some issues with it. It does suffer at times of sequelitis. But overall, the characters and what they go through are bringing it back to um, the good forefront that it was and, and made a very enjoyable film. Okay. Kat, what about you? What, uh, what, are, what are your final thoughts on the film? It, it's probably up there with some of the best of Marvel sequels because Marvel doesn't always do sequels, well, but they, they really did right by Guardians of the Galaxy. It was really fun, a, a real uh, eyegasm to watch. I mean, I really, really liked it. Okay. Well, uh, I'm kind of in a weird position because, you know, hand I didn't really, I, I, like I said, I've, I've, I've mentioned, I've, I've been, I was disappointed with this film. Uh, it certainly had its good moments, but it, like I, said, I, I was rather underwhelmed by it. But I can't really, I'm not really sure if that's because of, of problems with the film itself, or maybe if I went in, uh, if it was doing something that I just wasn't seeing. Uh, so, you know, I don't know. Like to, 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 I was disappointed by it. To me, it was a disappointment. I won't go so far as to say it was an outright bad film, but it, to me, didn't live up to uh, what we got with the first film. Uh, which again, I don't know. Maybe that's my biases. I don't know. Um, so, but anyway, but this is the part of the show where we give our final ratings on the. Th- 
rating scale from best to worst is see it now, wait for matinee, wait for DVD, wait for cable, don't even bother, and Brian's rating, fuck this movie. So, uh, Kat, let's start with you. What's your final rating for Guardians of the Galaxy 2? Um, see it now. Obviously, if you haven't seen Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 1, you should watch that first, but it does make a decent standalone film. So if you haven't seen the first one, you can still go see it now anyway. Okay, Brian, what about you? No, I agree. I think it's a good see it now film. Um, I, I think most of America, most America, most of the world actually, and UK getting it first. Damn it! But um, no, it, this is a, this is a good film. I would definitely say go see it. Even if you didn't see the Guardians of the Galaxy one for whatever reason, go see this film. Um, just be warned it. You know, it's it could be a roller coaster at times. Okay. Have your tissues ready. <laughs> All right. Well, um, like I said, I I I'm, I think I'm going to do something that I don't think I've ever done on uh, this show before, and I'm actually going to abstain from giving a rating because I feel like any rating I give uh, would I, I can't really give a rating righteously because I'm still kind of processing my uh, my thoughts on the film and and the things I liked and things I didn't like. So uh, I, I mean, I don't know. I'm 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 probably going to go see the movie again and see if I can if I can process it a little more and then maybe come back and. Uh, give a be able to give a, a, a rating righteously, but right now I just I, I can't really give a call one way or the other uh, and be able to stand by it. So uh, I guess uh, you know without my rating, I guess uh, it, Brian and Cat are both saying see it now. So uh, you know you know if 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 you decide to go see it now, I mean you know hey that's your prerogative. Uh, but I'm going to actually abstain from giving a rating this episode because like I said, I just I can't I'm still processing. So, but that's all the time that we have for Nerd to the Third Power this week. Thank you, as always, for tuning in. We will see you next week where you're discussing something that I have been really looking forward to and been really excited for, and that is the Mystery Science Theater 3000 Netflix revival, which I am really looking forward to. I think we're going to have a lot of fun with that discussion. So we will see you next week. Thank you, as always, for tuning in. We will see you next week. As always, I'm Dr. Gonzo. I'm McCann. I'm Brian. And we will see you next week. Taka, play us out. 